historically, cycling is very much a European sport. If you were the boss, you were the boss. And that person set the culture. There was no other team jelling around you and allowing for somebody with a different personality. You had an American, Greg LeMond, who was a junior world champion, burst onto the scene as a star, and he would sneak out of the hotel after burning 8,000 calories during the day to have a little bit of ice cream. But if he got caught, he got in trouble. Some teams you would look at them and it looks really robotic from the outside. The system was really stuck in its ways. Well, where did the Green Edge team start? Boy, it was a brainchild of Jerry Ryan, there was no doubt about that. I grew up in Bendigo, which is a, um, a cycling town. I had an, a bike, but uh, lots of ambitions, but very little ability. And Jerry has got a working class background, and you look at a lot of the sports that he supports, or the clubs that he supports, they are working class. Cycling, for the reasons of the qualities of the athletes, just got him. So the hard work, the toughness, the resilience, um, he admired. A little detour moment. Detour moment. The, it's been the, a special day. And John, watched, you did declare, you did declare that something would go wrong <laughs> with our accommodation. So I'm sitting there watching all the teams roll into to uh, Paris for the last time, um, and. Uh, uh, every car had a uh, country flag on it. Uh, there was no Australian flag. So I rang Shane Bannon. And, and I was driving this van down towards Brescia thinking, what, 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 what does he want to talk about? What's it take to uh, set up a team? Uh, because next year I want to see an Australian flag uh, on a car. I didn't know what to say. I, uh, I knew that this was the, the opportunity that um, a lot of us had been working for for around 20 years. Shane Bannon has been instrumental to the growth of Australian cycling and he was involved in the career of a lot of Australian cyclists that made it to the top of the food chain. So why wouldn't you back him? It took a long time to plan. We set out uh, on the journey without a major sponsor. There's 18 teams in the top division of world cycling and Movistar, Sky, BMC, they're at the top few and Orica sits somewhere there in the middle and it's a bit like that movie or the book Moneyball. It's about using the budget wisely. The most money doesn't necessarily deliver the best results. Well, the sports directors in a team are the most important people now. I mean, these guys are colonels of the, of the battle plan. They've got their army and they're going to plan every day. And Matt White brought fun into the team, but serious. He can let his hair down. He knows how to have fun after dark. He's human. He's flesh and blood, good at some things and probably not good at others, like perfectly imperfect, if you know what I mean. 
Usually we don't stop at McDonald's, but uh, it's Cooma and we're quite limited where we're stopping. As you can see, the boys are enjoying their nutritious... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> quite uh, abrupt's not the right word, but he is certainly, it's very black and white. What the fuck do you think you're doing? <laughs> and he's running up in them, he's he, he made the first contact. I let the F-bomb drop a little bit. Uh, sometimes I'm a little bit passionate about the way I express myself. No, don't sing off, keep it going, come on, come on. You can do it, get a bit more. Fuck. Let's go, go! Go! Let fucking go! Let fucking go! Yes! Oh! No. Fuck! Oh! I know that, you know, being pig-headed, I suppose, as we all are, then I know that that's the right way to do it. Whitey says that that's the right way to do it. Shane might say that's the right way to do it. We had our, our conflicts, you know. We uh, we locked horns. Right of selection, I would I would say, would be the the point that was most discussed. We wanted to create an international team with the Aussie DNA. We had two r very distinct tiers of, of riders. We had the young, talented group, which we're going to need a few years to really to mature. And then we wanted to surround those guys with uh, the uber-experienced guys who'd been there, done that. Like Stuart O'Grady, Robbie McEwen, Baden Cook, were all iconic riders in, in, in their particular era. When you set out building a team, you need some riders that can get results. But probably more importantly, you need riders that set the culture. And that's why Simon Gerrans was the key signing when this team got established. I never really, from an early age, dreamt of you know, competing as a professional. It just seemed so far-fetched because I was asthmatic and my parents encouraged, encouraged me to do a bit of swimming. Um, so then I was in the swimming club and, and competing as well. So it really didn't matter what I was doing. Um, I wanted to compete in it. When he was told by the Australian Institute of Sport as an under 23, you're probably not good enough, go and find another job. He went and raced in Norway with a small team and barely made ends meet. That didn't quite work out. At 24, 25 years of age, he was racing as an amateur in France. And he was the best amateur in France that year, got his first professional contract, and then kept just chipping away and making those improvements. Gero, uh, he scares me sometimes. He's very demanding on the mechanics, he's very demanding on the directors, he's very demanding on the staff. But if you dig a little bit deeper, you look at him and the most demanding person is, is on himself. Sometimes I think, how do you have the energy for that? How can you be bothered for that? But that's a great quality that then fires me up as well. So I feel quite lucky to, to have his energy around. In our first year, we employed or contracted 30 riders. Now, it's the team's ability, the service, and maximise the service surrounding those riders. We have two buses, two trucks, six vans, 14 cars, three doctors, physios, 10 masseurs, 10 mechanics, two coaches, a sport physiologist. Where we see the team going is, at the end of the day, just because you've got an Australian passport doesn't mean you've got a job for life here. You know, this, is, this team, number one, is about performance. If he's not the right fit, or if he's not the, the right talent, we, were, we would look, look around the market and get other, other people from different countries. Uh, Swain Tufts, his surname sums it up. He's the bare grills of cycling. He'll survive, no matter what the circumstances. You know, I used to stack railway ties, uh, construction, worked in uh, cleaning a butcher shop. And I knew nothing about bike racing at the time, but I just knew I liked pushing myself. And I got a second-hand bike and built up a trailer and threw all my equipment in there and my dog as well. And, and I would just start doing expeditions up to Northern British Columbia. And I was truly free of a lot of those material things that um, keep you kind of tied to, to the world and society at the moment. <laughs> So Jerry approached me, wanted me to film like behind the scenes content, really to engage with fans and set up a YouTube channel. And hopefully if we did content that not just your diehard cycling fans could watch, we could build a bit of a subscriber base. Me, 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 me. 
<laughs> so when we started, we basically filmed cooking videos and you know fishing videos, and we had a racehorse that didn't do any good. Um, but we just wanted to really extract the personalities of these guys. He um, he's bringing the bogan out and everyone down to a fine art. So uh, you you can't help yourself every now and then. You do say some silly stuff. Look, there was a bit of a fear with all these Aussies coming together that it was going to be a big a big party team, big. Uh, a big, big bunch of lads, you know, all in the same team, finally uh, having a great time. Uh, and it definitely was a bit of that at the start. Green, 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 green! I fucked it up. <laughs> From the outside, it looked like a team that was having some fun. But were they serious? Because of the fact that we spent all these years in European teams, now we had our own team and our own culture. But when I kind of look back on it, I don't think we really knew what we were doing. Yeah, so we're doing we're doing sprint drills, and uh, so we run about a three kilometre effort. We should sort of roll through for a couple of k, and then for a k, just peel. Yeah. Jens Morris is leading out. Jens Kuklier. Adis oh, has got to stay with group. Thomas. One big group. You're racing each other. We have got a first aid kit in the car, it's gonna all in and the and we've got snakes for the winner. <laughs> we've got snakes for the winners. I had to, we had to get around the guys and ha make the finish line. The finish line was going to be where the car is. So we parked the car, and I came in a little bit hot on the uh, on the grass there, and also I didn't realise that the road was uh, fading away so steeply. Yeah, we're fucked if it does. Shit. Whoa, 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 whoa! That's fucked. Just squinch or. Actually, now we've uh, been spot of bother. Shit. Oh, someone's crashed. Oh, shit, see? Oh. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, we're just on the side of the road. We're just, uh, it's been a bike accident. Yeah, yeah. What's it? Oh, that's Jim Devine uh, in the Snowy Mountains in, uh, in New South Wales. Have you got it? Let's just push the car out and then drive him to the hospital. Stuff. Um, Where you push it out? Has anyone got a GPS where we exactly are? Fractured my scapula. You know, I've had a fair few crashes over my life, but I've never had one in training. So, you know, it was a, a bit of a shock to me. And well, what are we putting ourselves at that risk for? It probably wasn't the ideal thing to be doing at that time of year. 91 Hospital in Kuma. What are you doing? I'm going to go to the hospital with the boys. The biggest issue for a team like this, the biggest challenge they face is, what do you do when there's a bit of a, there's a bit of a screw up or there's a bit of a mistake or you put all your eggs in one basket and you don't come through with the win? A lot of teams unravel because the camaraderie is not good. And as soon as there's a disappointment, everyone starts blaming it on one another. Oh, it's his fault. Oh, it's her fault. Oh, we shouldn't assign this rider. Oh, that's a, that's a crap sponsor. We're in Ballarat, still with boxes of wheels and, and, and gears and stuff that's been shipped from Japan and the frames had been shipped from Switzerland. There was, their clothing wasn't quite right. Uh, there was all a bit of that confusion because we didn't have time to think about uh, too much about tactics or wind conditions or all that sort of stuff. We were just trying to get the bikes on the road. And yes, there was major anticipation about how are they going to go. The cycling season is broken up to the three big grand tours, the three week races, tours of France, Italy and Spain and the five monuments, the big one-day races. Four of those are at the start of the season, the spring classics. Milan San Remo is the first big race of the season, one of the most important. This is their first big goal, and it would be the first real test. Had they done enough work to get ready? The Europeans who come to Australia they know the Aussies are tough people, but that's where it ends. They know when they come into their garden, into Europe, that's where the real cyclists live. The Milan San Remo is, is the longest one day classic in the world. One of the most beautiful races on the calendar. The Italians will tell you it is the most beautiful. Yeah! This classic gets enormous publicity around the world because it starts the year as far as they're concerned. 
from Milan is 300 kilometers down to the coast and all these big champions winning it just adds to the history, adds to the, the mystique of the race. Yeah, Anyone who wins Milan San Remo is instant rock star in Italy. Yeah, the boys in the bus. Yeah, good spirit. Only 300k to do. Look after yourself. You're more valuable in the final, man. Yeah. Yeah, 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 I know. Plenty of other guys do that rest of that role. Everybody is feeling the effects. Uh... Oh dear. Oh, Gilbert's on the floor. Yeah, mate. Is it five or six down the ground? I can't see any of ours, okay? No, no, we're good to go. We're good to go. Okay, mate. With uh, nine kilometres to go now to the uh, Poggio, I've got a feeling Fabian is looking that way. He just looks so calm. Fabian Cancellaro, we called him Spartacus. Spartacus did all the talking with his spear and shield. It's a huge victory for Fabian Cancellaro. Other riders looked at Cancellaro and they were, they were in fear because they feared if they let him go by a length, they weren't going to get him back. Gero, you know what to do on the Poggio. As Johnny Hugelan goes and straight the way past him goes Vincenzo Nibali with Simon Gerrans in his wheel. Come on, Gerrans. Brilliant ride by Gerrans. And Cancellaro having to respond. And here we go. This is the descent of both Nibali and Cancellara can go downhill like a stone. That's the way, Garrett. Just take the wheel, take the wheel. And on that final descent of the Poggio, he was doing 1,000 watts out of each corner, sprinting to stay with Fabian, one of the best descenders in the world. <sighs> Fabian, Fabian's dropping them, trying to drop them. Maybe five metres on Simon. Oh, that could be dangerous. He's just got his head down and he's trying to ride as hard as possible. Oh uh... well, I was like, just screaming at the television on the descent to get back on that wheel. Uh, he's coming back. Come on, you can't give him one metre. There's not enough gap for them to start playing cat and mouse. Perfect, Gero, just take the wheel. 12 seconds they've got, Cancellara has got his head down, the four-time world time trial champion. Under the one kilometre to go, Banner. Here we go, boys, fingers crossed. Looks over his shoulder, Fabian Cancellara, not the position he would like to be in, but he's always going to be a marked man for this sort of thing. Cancellara still the man pulling along. Degen Kolb is leading this chasing sprint out, but I don't think they're going to make it. Simon Gerrans on the left. One of the masseurs grabbed me, hugged me, picked me up, and he cracked right on my ribs. It hurt, I couldn't quite breathe, but like, I didn't care. <laughs> I don't believe this. Jerry Lyon's such a lucky side. He's gone, and, he's gone and won the biggest classic in the world at the first attempt. It showed that it was a, a real team, a serious team. Yeah, I don't think this, this win's gonna sink in for a little while. So I uploaded all the video footage to YouTube and I didn't really think much of it. But it wasn't until we went to America not long after where I thought, geez, you know, these videos are starting to travel. Bottles, we're on TV, guys. Oh, we're on Backstreet's Pass. Hey, that's yeah. Great. What's up? Oh, it's so cool. Hey, how you doing? Where's yeah. the team? The team Lux from Dothan Oaks right here. How you doing, mate? Hey, got to say a few words to Australia? Angel City, my favorite band, the Angels. Take me away to Marseille. Got a monkey on my back and I, 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 I can't shake it. <laughs> Woo. I like the I like the US Marshal right. thing too. Excellent. Yeah. Dan Anasonora. Hey go. I'm Ian. Uh, yeah, for the Bond Trigger Live Strong team. I'm a fan of the uh, backstage pass. Yeah, I just wanted to see if I could get on the show. So I'm a fan. And then from Milan San Remo, everybody heads up to the north for another big one day race. It's the most famous cobbled classic, and it's the one that matters the most. It's the hell of the north, Paris Roubaix.
Paris Bay is special for many reasons, but not least, of course, the cobblestones. Uh, they say Napoleon's army is tramped over the very same stones that the riders now race across the farm tracks. It's like going into battle. It's, it's some sort of mad adventure race. There's only 50k of cobbles out of 250k. So it sounds really simple until you go and try and ride it. People's forks break, wheels will break, flat tires will happen. Things drop off bikes you never knew you had on bikes. Everybody prays for rain except the riders, of course. If it's a dry race, then you're totally immersed in dust, um, and the crowd just go there to see the carnage. It's as simple as that. The Paris Bay suits, uh, it suits a very hard man. The, the big Belgian man on the spot was, was the Belgian Tom Bonin. As he lines up for the finish now, he equals the record of four victories of Roger de Vlaming, another great Belgian cyclist, and Tom could have a few more in him yet. He's big and he's strong, but he's but he's also got the smarts and he's got a lot of self-belief. And you know, when you just go across the cobbles, blokes would just die in his wheel. The names of the riders who have won Pairu Bay are on the walls of the showers, and that's where they put them. The race that everybody hates to ride and everybody wants to win. When you think of Paris Bay, you think of the warriors of the sport and you think of Matthew Heyman. He's a guy who's started the race 13 times and made it to the finish line every time. My worst or most memorable Roubaix was I ended up riding 10 minutes behind the last group by myself for about 100k. And uh, I even cleaned up a lady on one of the last sections because no one expected any more riders to be coming through. They're all packing up and going home. and. Yeah, so, I mean, I finished dead last and 10 minutes behind the last last guy. I fell in love with the race pretty early on. The further I've got in my career, the, the more I've uh, enjoyed doing it. And, uh, yeah, it's just the more the relationship has blossomed. Always keep riding, whatever happens. It's worth getting to the velodrome because no other race you come in and finish on a velodrome like that. That lap is always emotional. Yeah, I started with one team, a rubber bank, in, and it was pretty military, pretty old school, pretty hard. You know, just like the army, they know that you'll do what, you're, what you've been told because you've been kind of beaten down and then, then you fit into the system. I moved into some kind of student accommodation, so it was just a, a communal kitchen and, and um, I had a little bedroom and, and a shower. It was lonely. Um, you're, you're a 17 year old on the other side of the world, you don't speak the language. People can smile at you all day, but if you don't understand what they're saying, you're pretty isolated. When you close the door and there's no noise and it's just, just you, and that's when you think about home. I was pretty down a lot of the time. I guess mum and dad got worried about me a fair bit because, you know, I guess they saw the signs of a bit of depression. Yeah, I got to the point where I wasn't sure I could make it as, as, as being the guy that finishes it off every time. I made that decision that I was going to be a good helper. Um, and maybe, yeah, maybe looking back, it wasn't, you know, it was a bit of a safer option. He's such an incredible super domestic. Uh, he was not a winner. He was a, a super helper. Now Team Sky have decided to take the responsibility of they putting the to. pressure on. I think there was a Roubaix there with, with Sky and, and I did a lot of work and then, you know, ended up in front of a lot of guys that I was riding for. And that's, I guess, when I, you know, I thought maybe it was time to change and, and, and go to, to a new team. The role of a domestique in a race like Paris-Roubaix is to protect your leader, to keep them in the right position before you hit the pavate sections. And the most feared one, not famous, the most feared one, is the Arenberg Forest. The first real sector of bad roads, it comes after about 100 kilometres of the race. Once they're over that level crossing which enters the forest, you just hit it so fast. Speeds approaching 70 kilometres, almost 50 miles an hour as they go into the uh, tranche. It's uh, two and a half kilometres long. The race may have gone in with 200 riders, but it comes out with maybe 50 to 100 riders still left in Paris Bay. Going in is uh, is pretty scary. Uh, you know, I've seen guys lying there with broken legs and things like that. As they hit the forest of Arnhemberg now, the bones are rattling here. This is a long stretch, dead straight, oh! and it's a rider now straight away. And that was Grisha Janotska who misjudged it totally. Inherently, the sport is dangerous, isn't it? I mean, so fast, 
uh, so desperate to get that result. Guys are willing to take those risks. It takes a lot of guts to throw yourself into those, especially those sprint finals and some of those descents. We're all so focused on the end result and the big thing that everyone's driving towards, but sometimes horrible things do happen. Now, some people say, yeah, OK, cyclists say they can suffer and they can ride all day and stuff like that, but it's not footy. You're not hitting each other. Right? Try jumping out of a car at 70k an hour onto the bitumen. See how you pull up. Cyclists are the toughest athletes in sport, and I believe that. You could break a collarbone in cycling and ride the next day, because they do. Every part of you saying stop, this is ridiculous. But on the other side, I think it only takes one little voice in the back of your head saying, get to the finish. Maybe it's not as bad as you think. Pulling over and stopping hurts way more than, than riding with a broken collarbone. I've had the biggest moments of that poor feeling when I haven't actually been watching and I've just started to receive messages. And then I can't find out what's actually happening and I can't see it with my own eyes. So they're the most difficult parts for me. So I'm in the Team Colombia. Um, do this race and crash straight for one signal, a transient signal, on the head and the shoulder. I can't remember the accident. When we received a call, and on the internet, it also appeared that Esteban had had trauma cranencephalic. Fractura de yunque, eh, mandíbula, clavícula, costillas, músculo y estaba en un coma inducido por para desinflamar y que se calmara. The the problem started in the recovery period after that when it became obvious that he had no movement in in his arm on that side. It was, became apparent that he had significant nerve injury to, well, three different nerves around his shoulder. I visit 10 doctors, and only one tell me, you can recover. Nine tell me, you need to take the insurance, and you forget you can, again, do cycling. Hacia terapias, y no, no había avances. Y eso lo, lo deprimía mucho. Y um, verlo, mucho. verlo llorar. Y verlo a él en esa lucha interna con, consigo mismo y con Dios era muy difícil porque... Uh, he went back to Colombia where he consulted a surgeon over there and they um, decided that they would do a, a transplant of the nerves. And so they transplanted a nerve from his lower leg and did three nerve transplants around his shoulder to the muscles, uh, the nerve supply to the muscles that weren't working. Um, and that's a pretty brave thing to do to a young guy uh, relatively soon after an incident like that. In one situation like this with your real friends, and the real friends is mom, dad, my brother, and the, the doctor do the surgery. Well, I'd actually done things like the, the suits for the London Olympic bid, so that involved like 138 athletes and everybody was like a prima donna, everybody was like tense. I had to make suits for like Tony Blair that kept me waiting six hours before I could measure him. Wouldn't do that again. Um, whereas like at Green Edge, first of all, it was like, how do you actually create a kind of suit look for these guys that I had never even probably worn a pair of shoes, let alone a suit. It was just lay back, it was like a bunch of mates having a great time. There's 28 riders on the team, but only nine of them get a spot at the Tour de France. So there's a lot of pressure early in the season to try and get your spot. There's some that know right from the very beginning that they'll be going. 
but there's a lot that it's their childhood dream. You know, back in 1903, when they wanted to bring a big challenge for the sporting people of France to sell newspapers, nobody dreamt it would develop into the greatest annual sporting event in the world. And the Tour de France now in July is when everybody plans their holidays and all riders hope they can compete in the Tour de France. Like tennis has got the Grand Slams, cycling has got the Grand Tours, and the Tour de France dominates. It's the Holy Grail. Doesn't matter what the course is, everybody goes there 100%. Finally made it, Ben. All the stars right now believe it. It's good. I was only walking through your neighbourhood. I just got to keep pinching myself, and uh, it is uh, just so exciting for everyone involved and everyone back in Oz and, and, and you know, all the riders, our international riders, and their supporters around the world. Every team goes into the Tour de France wanting to do something. Our objective was to, to win a stage. Anywhere I go, there you are. There you are. Everyone make that effort to be on the front. Bagan is winning. Oh. Easy. And Sarvan is coming clear to get his first stage win at the first attempt. That is unbelievable. Well, the early years of Backstage Pass was a heap of fun because very little structure. So it was easy just to go out and have fun and, and literally just take the piss on just about everything. Uh, we'd brought in Special Forces Stevens to... Uh, to drive things today and he, he said if I don't get one of the boys into the break well I'm gonna wash the cars. So my number one tip for coming to the tour as a fan, grab your bike, ride one of the big mountains, feel what the riders feel, really get into it. These people have followed the last tip and guess what? You're going to the VIP! <laughs> All the success leading up to July can go out of the window if you don't ride well in the Tour de France because the world focuses on the Tour de France. They don't know about Milan San Remi or Paris Roubaix in the same level. Go, 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 Come on! Come on! Come on! Come on! Come on! Rifle's won it. Oh. Blue, and he's got third oh. second. Second. Nice. Well, we were kind of knocking on the door all the time, and killing ourselves for every sprint, killing ourselves for Gossi, and you know, things just weren't working out. Yeah, it's just been a mad tour. You know, a lot of young kids out there don't know how to ride bikes. Um, you know, <laughs> just a lot of inexperience, a lot of desperation, a lot of nerves, um, you know. I think everyone just needs to chill pill. I think when we were getting so close to getting a result in, in those races, it probably motivated the riders, but it made the management get more desperate. And, and that's when the decisions were being made to commit to riding the front for long periods of time to bring back breakaways for, for stage wins. And all we were doing is burning matches. Yep. Not up today, dude. I feel like shit. No one's helping us. Come on, man. Don't think about the others. Hey, we've already well, committed. I don't give a fuck about the others. I feel like shit. Well, then he gets his chance. Hey. Are the guys still riding for me? Hey. I hope the guys are not riding. We're riding for the team. You just take your chance and the others take theirs as well. All right? Yeah, I'm not trying, but... There's no pressure, Gossy. Yeah, I'm not up. Why are we riding with no one helping? Hey, we can't control anyone else, man. One thing I've noticed in the last hour is uh, the boys are more motivated than ever. 
it's it hasn't been a very uh, uh, fuck it. There's 22 teams at the Tour de France, and there's 21 stages. Game of musical chairs, someone's going to miss out. And you get sprinters in there that win multiple stages. And they were one of the ones that were left without a chair when they arrived on the Champs-Élysées. Yeah, we did this just before, but we just lost a bit of paper, so... Cam, Trav, Not Christian free. Meyer and uh, Daniel. The year before we uh, got the team on the road, uh, I did the Tour de l'Avenir with the, the Australian national team. Tour de l'Avenir means Tour of the Future. Avenir is future. And so these are the kids of the future. I got to see Esteban, saw him on the podium, yeah, when, when some of our boys had some success as well. So from that time on, I sort of, yeah, when I was look, looking through results, I just noticed his name coming up. And it was really quite pleasing to say, oh, that's that little fella that won the Tour de here. So it's not surprising uh, Esteban Chavez, as soon as he put his name on the winner's list, he was going to be a man that everybody wanted to sign. Firstly, I noticed his race results disappeared. I went dug back a little bit further. We contacted his manager. His manager explained the situation, that he'd had this bad fall, really hurt his shoulder, and the operation didn't, didn't go so well. He had a great career up until the point of his accident, and why not uh, let's see if we can get in, in contact with him. Him call me. Uh, speaking in Spanish. Hey, I'm Neil Stephens, so I'm Australian, I'm from Orica Green Age team. Fuck off. It's no, it's no good for jokes. I'm, I'm bad, so if you, you know are obviously Neil Stephens because you don't speak English. I, uh, those early phone calls, I suppose, with Esteban, uh, I really started to get to know him as a, as a guy, as a person, but I really wanted to start that that personal relationship to see, you know, how things were going, what we're going to do in the future, and work out how we were going to get him back to Europe to assess his injury. The the arm is totally dead, but every morning when I'm up, it's easy you say, yeah, I'm gonna stay here in home, but I, I'm a one step for for my dream, for starting the Vuelta, for do the Giro, for do the Tour de France. Eh, Nori fue la terapeuta de él, en donde ella tenía que estar a las 7 de la mañana, lo citaba entre 7 y 8. Eh, a las 8 de la mañana hacían un calentamiento para él empezar sus ejercicios. Esteban llegaba a las 6, calentaba. Cuando ya llegaba Nori, él ya estaba caliente y salía de su terapia y llegaba a la casa a continuar con las terapias. Todo el día, todo el día, todo el día, todo el día. But I think in all time in, okay, in September, I need to do this because my life can change. The light in the final of the tunnel is Orica. The first time we physically met up with each other was the day in September when uh, we had a doctor from the team, a physio from the team and myself. We had to meet up with him, go behind him on the bike and to assess if he was going to be able to ride for us uh, three months later. Uh, and he's just so young. When he first came, he had bands on his teeth. And uh, Matt White came in, and he was talking to the other guys. And, and um, he virtually ignored Esteban. And I was thinking, well. And so I, I said, uh, I, I introduced them to each other. And, and Whitey said, oh, yeah, nice to meet you. And then Whitey said to me afterwards, I thought it was just a local kid come in to watch, <laughs> watch what was going on. Because he looked about 12. Now his handshake, it was like shaking someone's hand who had a stroke. Yeah, he is, is a kid whose career is on the line and uh, he's got to perform against, uh, in front of people that he's never met before. The expression, he was shitting himself. Well, you know what, it was like he's very uh, you know, upfront and uh, uh, he was very matter of fact about the whole thing. You know, this is, OK, Esteban, this is what we're going to do and this is what we want to see and uh, let's go, let's do it. He rode for a little while, and I know that he was really nervous because he was riding as fast as he could. He got out of the seat, but when he got out of the seat, I noticed that he cheated. He pushed forward and up. He didn't just get out of the seat. So I knew his arm wasn't great. My 
my advice to the team at that time was uh, you, you really can't take this guy on until there's at least some sign that the nerve is actually kicking in again. Shane said, hey, it's a risk. You know, he needs help. He, he may not recover. You know, he was young, but he had a good attitude to this whole thing, and uh, I think that's important. His uh, values are what uh, get him through. You, when you look through his, his smile into his eyes, you can see this really committed, hungry person that really wanted to, to achieve and really wanted an opportunity. Well, Dana tell me nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Just talking about races and speaking English, and I know I understand nothing. So, um, yeah, Steve was telling me like this, like, "Hey, boy, welcome to the team." So, fuck. Uh, yes, I, I tried for a stay, like, thank you, but inside is, <laughs> I take the cell phone straight and, hey, bro. Oh, ho, ho, Fuck, I'm in the team. <laughs> ah, congratulations, bro. Le dije que si él iba a ser un gran ciclista tendría que ser aquí en Europa. Y cuando vino la primera vez era muy emocionante porque sabía que iba a venir a cumplir un sueño. Vengo de de un padre que dijo que que nunca iba a vivir de ciclismo y que no, no era posible cumplir mi sueño. My father is happy, obviously, but it's more, this is your second opportunity in life, so no, 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 no take this opportunity and put in the garbage, you focus. The first training camp is hard because I can't speak in English. I don't understand nothing. Just go for the meetings and... <laughs> we just hang out at the first training camp. We're both new to the team. He's my roommate, and him is really proud about this job. I like him, his mentality. He uh, tells me to relax a lot. I don't know why we clicked so well so early on. Um, he thought I was German. Um, he met me and said, you know, they said, this guy is Australian. His hair's like this, he's straight down the line, he's got to be German. So I'm in the room, like, alone, and he, he passed, and he looked at me, and just, you know, tell me, come on, come on. So, fuck, maybe one meeting or wherever. And he got all his clothes on and he started walking. He thought, geez, we're walking for a while. And he tried to speak to me and I only say yes, but no, I understand nothing. We actually went down the shops for a coffee and he thought I was saying he had to go to a team meeting or something. So he had no idea what was going on. Yeah. And he just smiled his way through the first two training camps. And, um, but that being said, he did not at one point exclude himself from the group. He had no idea what was going on, but he'd spent hours sitting with us and he'd smile when everyone smiled and, and you could tell that he wanted to be a part of the group. He didn't want to be on the outside. We come from tribal people, being in groups and communities, and I think a lot of us are still searching for being part of a group that does something special. The, the 2012 Tour de France, where we, going, we went so close so many times, we hadn't achieved what we wanted to as yet. So we really did have something to prove in that tour. Well, all the preparation's done now. We're at the start of stage one. Uh, it's going to be an exciting stage and a really tense one. And the 100th edition of the Tour de France rolls away from Porto Vecchio. Destination Bastille. 
Well, is this the day that Olika Green Edge uh, claims the victory they've really wanted? The first Australian team to take part in the Tour de France as they course now through the vineyards here. And they'll need every, all the shelter they can get now as they're literally on the beaches of the Mediterranean Sea. And it was, it was developing into an incredible finish. It really was, and they're about 20, 20 miles out, 32 kilometers still to go. They've nudged it out, 16 seconds the gap. I arrived at the finish line and there wasn't a team bus. I said, we, we need the bus, purely from the PR exercise. And he said, Neil, where's the bus? I was in the second car in the, in the race and I said, the bus is at the hotel. It's just down the road from the finish. I made a couple of phone calls and spoke to the bus driver. He said, yep, I can get it there. It became imperative that this really expensive brand new bus was down at the finish line with all the others. So we got down there and as we were driving in, it was, it was late. But organisation said, bring it in, hurry up, get in there, don't slow down because the race is coming. The organiser had thought that everybody was in, but when the last bus is through, they actually drop the finishing line, they winch it down. And Gary, the driver, he, I mean, he was only in there for a couple of days filling in, it wasn't his bus to drive. So he was already nervous and we were getting towards the finish arch, he sort of had a look up. I said, no, she's right, they waved you through, that, that'll fit. My wife got very excited. Here comes the bus. And next thing, it was like the Titanic hitting the iceberg. And I was sitting up behind Gary, and I, I've nearly gone over the handlebars and leaned on top of him and seen this arch just lean forward and the people underneath it. The whole the stanchion started to tip towards where we were sitting. If we go off air suddenly, it's because the banners just hit my commentary box. It was so close to the finish, all the photographers were there getting ready for, you know, the bunch sprint. They all see this moment, all these cameras come up, all in unison. Sitting in the front of the bus, it's like you're sitting in a fishbowl, this great big glass window. I saw the cameras raise and I jumped from my front seat into the back seat where they couldn't see me anymore. I thought, oh, this is an absolute disaster. And it just got worse after that. The hour bus is looking to finish off. Now we're hearing race radio and they're organising a new finish. They will have the sprint finish for the end of the race at three kilometres to go. On Can't the finish front. there. Well, we looked at where they said it was on a bend. 8K to go, 7K to go, and I'm watching it on the screen, and they've wound it up there at full tilt. They're not going to get that bus out of there in the next 10 minutes. Six, five, and we're still not out from underneath this thing. Oh, shit myself. To know that we were potentially going to hold up the biggest annual sporting event in the world. My bus. He was having a meltdown. Oh, I just said, pull yourself together. Oh, I couldn't stop shaking. I thought for a, a few seconds that we were going to be the only team ever kicked out of the Tour de France for nothing to do with doping. It wasn't until this local Frenchman yelled out from across the banner, hey, why don't you let the air out of the tyres? Well, as we speak, the bus is backing off the finishing line. Now what will they do? Because they might well get this away. They're getting it down the road. You talk about pressure. I mean, the, the guy had to reverse that bus back 180 metres, reverse park it, and he had, he had about four and a half minutes to, to do it. Within minutes, less than a couple of minutes, the race came charging down the home straight and it used the normal finishing line. When they just pulled the bus off and it was sort of in amongst the crowd behind the barriers and everyone booing at the bus and it, it felt like an episode out of The Simpsons of people with pitchforks. <laughs> <laughs> coming to get us. I have a, a cluster. Uh, yeah, but why he changed that fucking program? They told us yesterday it's, it's, uh, it's better you don't have the buzzer to finish. It's better. He fucking changed the program and now, now I'm gonna have shit. Logistic, logistic. Fuck you, mate. I'm gonna have to face the music for the race organizers. I just try to, I'm gonna try to, I'm gonna try to stop, I just can't know where. You wanna park or? I'm gonna try to, but I don't, I'm under a bit of stress. I said, we had better win a stage. 
Otherwise, we're going to throw the keys in because I don't want to be known just as crashing a bus. That even became a little bit more pressure to actually do something in one of the, the stages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. See, that was the other thing. The, the air con got busted because when we hit the hit that arch, it hit straight on the air conditioning unit. No air co, couldn't get it fixed. So it's hot as hell down the south of France there in July. So yeah, we were going to the start of the to the stage, um, dripping in sweat. Blokes were doing everything they could. They were fanning themselves with the race book, uh, opening the fridge and freezer, and just standing in front of it. And uh, so it wasn't ideal recovery for the boys. Oh. Getting the biggest cheers, that's for sure. Actually, we came way too late to the race. We were running out of time. Nobody will, will like uh, had time to to warm up uh, properly. It wasn't like a, a big thing. Like I race for Italian teams, like there, yeah, there would be like uh, a, a big problem. Like people would panic. We didn't check out the course in the morning. The guys just went for a bit of a ride. We did one lap before the race started. There was no time to actually to get nervous. Came back, the boys did their thing on the home trainers, and away we went. So we got a good chance of uh, hopefully getting into the yellow jersey, but uh, it's the competition as well. The yellow jersey goes to the person that leads the race overall. So whoever's got the least accumulated time for the distance that's been covered to that point. <laughs> We knew we had to start fast. Everyone's on, Ken. Everyone's on. Let's go. It's a great start, guys. Looking for the apex around these corners. Very good. Okay, the 100 metres, you've got the heart left hand corner, then cobbles. Now it's Orica Greenet who looked to be challenging the time of Omega Farmer Quickstep. We started fast, but we were behind at halfway. Now this could be the time that might stand throughout the whole afternoon. It could be a time that I might tell Omega Farmer Quickstep. It's going to be one into this headwind. Gossie, you're on. Sit on, recover for a bit, Gossie. Just recover. There was one or two riders who were, were struggling a little bit. Big fast corner, full gas through here, full gas through here, full gas. You're on the wheel and you're you're like, oh, you keep thinking you need to be going faster. Swain, come on, Swain. I'll never forget this turn that, that Swain I took that was just, it, was, it felt like it was one of the fastest I've ever been. You literally felt like your helmet was going to get lifted off your head. We were going so quick. It's like when you're on a highway, you held your head out of the window in the car, like it was like... When you have everyone at a really good level, there's no surge in pace, there's no change. It, it's like this perfect flowing thing. 65k an hour is no, no problem. If they have pulled this one off, this will be a huge coup. I think they can see the clock now as they fight on here. And sprint it in, guys, sprint it in. Let's go all the way, everyone's on. Let's go all the way, all the way. It is going to be desperately close. They know how close they are. Look at the faces as they drive up towards the line. They've got five, six seconds, five seconds, four, three. They're sitting up as they hit the line. Oh, no. They are done. Guys, we are the fastest time by under one second. Fastest time by under one second. Fingers crossed for Simon Gerrans now. Is he going to be the next Australian to wear the Mayo Jaune? He's got to wait a little while yet. Yeah, and I will never forget like the, those a few minutes waiting. And this could be a good time. It's going to be very, very quick indeed. Well, it's, oh, it's hard to describe the adrenaline that was going through the group was unbelievable. While here on screen, we're seeing the arrival of the erstwhile team leaders of the Tour de France and the individual leader who is bringing them home here in the yellow jersey. But now it is over. And the next Mayo Jean of the Tour de France will be an Australian. And that will be Simon Gerrans as he now gets ready for the yellow jersey.
It's just the sweetest moment. It's like a dream, yeah? I had to pinch myself to say, hey, you know, like, uh, from uh, boiled lollies, crashing a uh, bus to, you know, chocolates and... Uh, You, know, you can have some great team rides that will enable individuals to win, but to have a, a team of guys that weren't the favourites and then to pop Simon Gerrans in the yellow jersey, uh, it was a dream come true and uh, I, I got goosebumps thinking about it. It was one that most of the mammals, the middle-aged men in Lycra, they related to it. You got a couple of guys in there that were in their late 30s as well, a few of the young Australians on their way through. It ticked all the boxes. expecting to win it and then obviously we won it and then Simon was in the yellow jersey and that was massive for the team. It was so much excitement you know and obviously he was then kind of in a different world because he was so bombarded by the press. It was a huge, it's a huge honour, it's a huge thrill you know like I've said the Tour de France is, the, is seen as the pinnacle of the sport you know I was really sort of finally soaking it up a little bit and, and not so preoccupied with what was happening and just enjoying being in the yellow jersey. So we're in the car and Gero had just done the yellow jersey presentations. He comes in and first thing he says is, I'm going to give the yellow jersey to Daryl tomorrow. If Simon Gerrans has been the Michael Jordan of this team, Daryl Limpy has been the Scotty Pippen. You look at all the results from Orica and Daryl is there. He's part of the lead out train for one of the sprinters, as he was for Simon at the Tour de France. He's there in the long one day races like Milan San Remo, supporting Simon Gerrans win that one. There is no race on the planet that Daryl Limpy cannot play a part to help Orica win. Daryl Limpy was still level on time with Simon. And I said to Daryl, how about, you know, we, we finish on bunch time today, we try and sap the front out of, out of trouble, and then I'll drift back, you finish in front of me, and, and then you can take the jersey. Because um, I kind of thought, you know, I could have potentially held the jersey for, for four days. Um, I was never going to hold it all the way to Paris. Um, and it was a life-changing experience just to have that jersey. So I thought, why not hand it on to a mate and change his life as well? Hey, that's makemanship's all about. That's what I said. That's what this culture and the organisation make. Okay? <laughs> It takes a big rider to actually share the glory with his teammates. So, of course, I'm always forever thankful for that, for that gesture. You'll be in those books as the very first, not just of a country, of a continent. How does it make you feel? Oh, magic. It's, uh, to, to be able to even say that I've worn the yellow jersey, you know, let alone say that I've written history for South Africa, is, uh, at the moment, I don't think anything can top this. I think everybody just, I reckon, me included, had a little bit of a tear on the day because that's, that's an emotional moment in sport because we all know what it means. For Simon Gerrans to get that jersey onto the shoulders of Daryl Limpy, it was met with disbelief, particularly by a lot of ex-pros that are in the commentary box who think from the perspective of the yellow jersey, you hold on to that for as long as you can, it's sacred. The culture of the team is one that that's not a big deal for us. I mean, we all, that's what we do for each other. And, you know, because you're a big name, then, oh, you deserve this. And it's, on this team, it's like, it, we all do our part. So everyone gets their chance and their opportunity. I remember my dad, just back in South Africa, 
invited everyone to the house to have a big party and they phoned me and it's, yeah, those moments unfortunately don't come too often. Right, our mission today, and we've chosen to accept it, is to give out a couple of thousand of these red hot Orica Green Edge guitars out on the road. Yeah, boys. Green <laughs> Edge, yes! Yeah! <laughs> I enjoyed the ACDC stuff because I felt, as soon as I put the wig on, I felt like I had a disguise and no one had recognised me, so it wouldn't matter what I did. Well, I actually almost lost my job uh, with that music video because what happened is in Spain you can buy fireworks pretty much over the counter, so we thought, you know, we'll take advantage of that. What we didn't expect is the firework to get caught in the park bench. Um, Sam Buley was about a foot away from having his legs blown off. The backstage pass brings a new dimension to the way you sell professional cycling. The guys have become entertainers, and we know how good they are on bikes. Now we're finding out how good they are as people and seeing the characters develop. Go, Doc, go, go, go. I sign with this team because I have music videos and because it's my unique offer. <laughs> but it's not, it's not like a serious all time, uh, you know, sad. Always fun because it's Australian. So the Australians is like that, it's the culture. People see that you've done a music video during the Grand Tour, they're like, what, how'd you do that? It became a really good distraction, you know, and a healthy distraction because, you know, you weren't just thinking about how hard it was and you were thinking about how can we do something else for the video, maybe in the stage and... Standing on the podium and doing the call me maybe and pointing to Dan Jones out in the crowd, now I'm interested. Look, I've never really been that into it, eh? If you go back to the call me maybe video, you'll see myself and Peter Weenings holding up signs saying we didn't want to do this and we really didn't. You know? Well, the music videos took fan interaction to the next level, and the best example we've got of that would have been Giorgio, this Italian fan who just decided one day he was going to walk on our bus. This is your day, mate. Yes, yes. It's yes. the best day of my life. Today? <laughs> yeah, really, really. St. Giorgio, the patron saint of Greenwich. What's your favourite backstage pass moment, or do you have a few? Uh, maybe the uh, 21 stage. Uh, of the Giro Italia last year, yeah. when a happy <laughs> came to the climb, uh, danced. Yeah, all night. Sing the whole night. That's it, big couple days ago, mate. You're on a cowboy. <laughs> <Yeehaw>! <laughs> hey, yeah, uh, Pete. Go. Out of Gero's seat, Giorgio's in there, mate. Oh, fuck it hell. That's, <laughs> that's where Gero used to sit. You go straight in there, mate. This is Gero's seat. Yeah, so there you go. Lex. This is the whole. Gero's Lex. Okay. All right, Giorgio. Well, glad we could make your dream come true and meet the boys. While you're here, we can get you a coffee or any beverages you'd like. Uh, no, thanks, because my hair. There you go. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Three cheers to Giorgio. You know, we really get to see what kind of goes on behind the scenes when they're not uh, in the race or they're not in a press conference or not in an interview. Kind of get to see their personalities, get to see that really raw emotion. But it just really opens the door to the human side of the racing, and that, that's what these guys have done a great job with that, yeah. <laughs> For the guys who did uh, Rubet before, after the feeds when it's completely new, eh? just uh, take attention there. It's not a race today, it's a recon. Eh? I've known Matty a long, long time since we were since we were kids and obviously you get one impression I think from the outside and then, then when you work with him you get another impression. But he, he's a perfectionist and he asks a hell of a lot from himself. And I'd said, you know, I want to, I want to be leader at these races and, and I'd, you know, talk to Shane and, and, and Whitey and the rest of the staff and now it was, it was game time. Now I had to walk the walk. 
he had his first big chance to be a leader in, the, in this team and he wanted, to, he wanted to prove what he could do. We had such a young team and then we had Heyman. That was kind of what it was. It was like these young guys learning and then this one older guy, pinnacle guy that we could learn from. So the idea is uh, for Matthew that uh, uh, Sam, you will stay around Matthew from the beginning. Mm -hmm. If something happens, you always, you're always there. They don't, that don't mean you have to sit in the wind all day with him, but around him. If you stop for a piss, you are there. Always with your leader. Fabian is not going to ride, a, ride across to a group on, on the road. He's not going to start riding on the front on the road. He'll just wait for a big long cobbled section, go get himself back in the race. You've got one of the most experienced guys in the bunch here. He's ran top 10 uh, out of the last three years, two times in the last three years. So there's no better guy to listen to than the guy on your team. A massive difference going from being a domestique with your only responsibility is doing what you're told to do to going to in, some, in a type of leadership role where you're required to then give the example, show the way. Then you get to race day and you realise that everybody's going to be riding for you and, and you're trying to turn off all that energy. Harry Wood Bay is probably one of the more stressful races for the mechanics uh, because of the wider range of work we have to do. When they crash, you've got to get there as fast as possible. You know you're already late getting there, and then you've got to decide whether they need a bike or a wheel change, so you create a lot more stress because a lot more equipment gets damaged on the, on the rough roads. It's actually faster if you just take it easy. Like you still jump out of the car quickly and, and you, you rush up as quick as you can to the bike. But if you try and do it really fast, trying to save time, uh, you end up fumbling it and you, you get worse. Yeah, I'm in Peru Bay here this afternoon, <laughs> but this is Tomica in person. He is a strong professional bike rider. He rides over the cobbles probably better than anybody else in the sport of professional cycling. The amount of mental um, energy, and I think guys get tired uh, mentally as much as they get physically. You know, you're looking at that wheel, you're looking for danger, you're looking, you're, you're constantly just analysing and, and, and making those little split-second adjustments. All right, Mitch, you can get up the front and help trick, mate. That's about five kilometres to the next section. When we were three guys there, I think there must have been about 30 guys left, and the brake was coming back, whether they sat up, I don't know, but 15 seconds, you know, 10 seconds. I was like, shit, I'm pulling this brake back on my own. Good work, Mitch, look at this. <laughs> I felt like that was my job and I was more than happy to do it because I knew those guys were going to give 100% to try and win the race. Not just to get a result, but to try and win. Heyman was up the road. His wheel collapsed on the, like the second last sector. So and it, was, it was just like frustration. He's approximately 300 metres ahead. Nicky Cherpser strikes gold. He wins the 112th edition of Paris-Roubaix, one of the finest editions of flat-out professional cycling we have seen in years. Sorry, mate. Thank you. You walk into the bus and You've just finished, you're just happy that you finished another Roubaix pretty much. And Maddie's in there, you don't really know what's happened with the race and Maddie's, you know, in, uh, in tears a bit in the back of the bus. For sure he would have felt, felt a big, uh, like he'd let the team down. Was that it? Was that the chance, you know? I was eighth once, is that going to be the best result ever? You're kind of like, oh, don't be so hard on yourself, Maddie. you know, next year. And you kind of look at it, you're like, I've been saying that for the last 14 years and I was running out of opportunities, um, you know. Uh, I felt like, you know, there's only so many left. You know, we're doing a, a six hour race and I'll get to the finish and that night will just be constant videos of the race. I'll just be awake at night, won't get to sleep. And it's like, why was I there? Why did I do that? And I'll just re-analyze it over and over again. You know, I, I'm a lot more comfortable in that position of helping other people.
After the, the surgery, when I started to ride again in the bike, in the bunch, in the races, I'm scared in the corners, maybe crash, or uh, maybe I suffering so much. Uh, it's possible these guys, I can I can make the same level like before. I couldn't uh, help but thinking there was something missing, and uh, I, I went to the uh, went to the doctor. We started talking about um, training files, about you know, weights, about you know, heart rates, and that sort of stuff, and. And uh, the dog said, oh, I haven't got any of that information. I said, what do you mean, I haven't got any of that information? Esteban hadn't been challenged, and quite deliberately so, because we were trying to be really careful with him. Uh, but it came the time when, OK, time to put the foot down. You could still see there were so many elements of his, of his, of his life and how he applied himself to, to cycling. Um, that needed to be addressed for him to, to win at the highest level. And, it, and it's frustrating to see these guys when they don't really apply themselves and, and they, they're not getting the best out of themselves. I went back to Esteban and I, and I said to him, mate, how is your weight? And we realised that he was, you know, just a few kilos over, overweight. And I said, look, whatever you want to do, it's, a, it's fine by me. You know, if you want to take it, if you want to go really hard, I'll go really hard. But if you want to just cruise through life, that's OK with me. I'll just cruise through life myself. If him say you something like that, maybe he have reason. I open the, the eyes and say, I need work hard. Because at that moment I work hard, but I need work more hard. For many, they look at the Vuelta as the third Grand Tour. It's the one at the end of the season. So for some, it's the last chance saloon. Others see it as their opportunity to shine for the first time. In terms of its culture though, the Spanish culture is something really special. They're super relaxed, but super enthusiastic. It's all cool, calm and collected until the peloton arrives. And then you see that raw passion, that Spanish flair and love for the sport, and they love their cycling. And Esteban was sent there with an opportunity, but also with expectation. In that time, he'd, he'd lost weight. Uh, he looked like a real climber. You could see he'd tick so many of those boxes and that he was ready to be competitive. And I think it was at that moment that the group unanimously thought, well, why not give him a shot? Let's see how he goes as team leader. And even much more experienced riders, like Matt Heyman, who rarely had his opportunity, got it at Paris-Roubaix in 2014, couldn't deal with that pressure. Well, it's one thing to get given a leadership role on a team, but then if you've got sort of other fears at the back of your head, not just the fear of failure, for Esteban it was also the fear of crashing. He had to face his fear head on and see if he could overcome it. G'day, welcome to the World of Spain 2015. Uh, starting off here in Porta Banus, got a team's time trial. So I had to work really hard coming back from injury at the Tour de France just to make the start and uh, I took in a bit of a different role of helping these younger guys for their chosen areas of the race. Hectic course, it's going to be the guys with the biggest uh, balls out there, so we're all going to go out there and give it a crack. Mate, you know how to do a start, you'll be all right. Just I can believe yourself, you'll be fine. Come on, guys, this is the fucking last K. Come on, guys, let's fucking rip it in. As the race went on, you could see he started to relax. If your leader has a demeanor that's relaxed, it spreads throughout the whole group. And it was starting to become evident that Esteban was really starting to have an influence on this team. The more important is just enjoy. Enjoy the ride, enjoy every day when you can go at the bike outside because you never know what happened at the final. <laughs> 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 
Chris Froome had just come off the back of winning his second Tour de France, um, but it was great to see him at the Vuelta. And Mike Turdo, as a, as a bike fan, said, where's Froome? And I said, uh, look, I don't really care. Where's Froome, mate? I, I'm interested in this dab on it. Went on from there that, and then he's asked me again. Yeah, but have you heard where from? Oh, you fuck. Oh, is he at the back somewhere? I suppose he was thinking he was going to attack, he was going to do something. And I said, mate, I don't, yeah, we don't really care where he was. A couple of days later, Froome went past the car. He happened to slow down a bit beside the car. I thought, I might as well tell him the story. Hey, Froome, Yo. you saw that video of his the other day? Yeah, yeah. The, the video with him the other day, is, my passenger said, where's Froome? I said, I don't fucking know where Froome is. Yeah, he fucking did not like that story, did he? <laughs> <laughs> That's embarrassing. And not only that, you're talking to the winner of the Tour de France, he's caught out in the wind, he's trying to get back into the group. He doesn't want you chewing his ear off about good stories, let alone that. Oh, crikey. What were you thinking? <laughs> Oh, fuck. Hey, Fermi, we didn't finish the story. <laughs> Possibly one of the worst <laughs> stories you've shared with us. <laughs> Another hot day, the temperatures soaring up into the mid 30s, the warmest day that we've had throughout this year's race. And there's the young Colombian, Esteban Chavez, who's still yet to prove himself as a team leader in this race so far. Matt Heyman was Conor Esteban's right-hand man for the, for the majority of the Vuelta. He, uh, he trusts me. He doesn't question anything I do. I'm always behind my boss, Heyman, and him always asks me, how do you feel? Yeah, I feel good, thanks. What do you need? No, no, I'm okay. 15 minutes after, what do you feel? He's bothered about the climb, surely. Big, big steam into town. That might catch out a few as well. And here we go. And this is going to start to hurt. I said, yeah, it's, 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 it hasn't been easy. And he kind of looked at me, really? Really, boss? Has it been that hard? It looks like it's going to be heartbreak for him because so many have got an interest. And look at the urgency behind Sean. In one moment, close to the final, the lads climb. He tell me, hey, look, look, all guys. All guys is full of salt. All guys suffering, I'm suffering. And you tell me all the time you feel good. If you feel good, good legs today, you can attack, you can, you, can, you can win. And he took off. And Chavez is going for it, but this man has got a, it's short of stature, but big of heart, as you can see. Oh, look at him, Jack. <laughs> But I didn't expect him to do what he did. He's on full attack mode right now. There's Steve Cummings. Venga, grande ahí, Esteban. Has trabajado duro para esto, eh? Venga. When we turned this corner and it was really, really steep. And there's Steve Cummings. He's going to sail by him as he comes up to this incline. And listen to the roar of approval. And he's still on the sexy. Oh, look at that. Almost to a standstill, Cummings. He's fucking popping him. He's fucking gone. I'd heard on the radio, Dumoulin's chasing, Dumoulin's chasing him. Go on, the, the leader's going after him. Fuck. This is our leader trying to hold on to the leader's jersey. What a great punch up we've got. And Tom Dumoulin means this. Come on. 13 seconds, eh? 13 seconds. 13, venga, vamos. 500 meters to go, though, uh, for Esteban Chavez of Orica Green Edge. Come on, Esteban. Venga. I see. Venga, campeón. This is our leader trying to hold on to the leader's jersey. And you start believe, no? <gasps> maybe, maybe. You back? Oh, really? 800 meters. Oh, fucking hell. Veo la llamada de mí y el posible fichaje a Lorica. Me hace una gran ilusión de este. Y es, um, verlo levantarse todos los días con una gran sonrisa y creer 
que el futuro ha cambiado. Este equipo hizo, no solo recuperó un ciclista, le, vol le volvió la vida a nuestro hijo. They are beating the hoardings here. It's a cacophony of sounds. But the biggest call of all is the name of Chavez. It's ringing back down the mountains. And with just desserts, this man is going to take the day. He's going to take it here amongst the crowds. He's enormously popular. Esteban Chavez. Oh, I'm sick of being old, all these young fellas winning races. He is all smiles, and so he should be. Chavez wins the stage, and Chavez is the new race leader. Sheriff ha creído en mí y es increíble, estoy realmente agradecido con él y más que ser <coughs> mi director, es mi amigo y es como un padre. Muchas gracias. Qué bueno, soy yo. <risa> uh, speechless, actually. Um, yeah, he summed it up. We've, um, we've had a dream, he had a dream, and we continue to dream. Hope you're there to enjoy it. Thanks. You <laughs> cry! Era mi sueño, y mi hijo me ha llegado a cumplirlo, a hacer realidad, estar. Nunca habrá con qué pagarle a Nil lo que él hizo por nuestro hijo. Es la vida, man. En la vida, you need keep him fight, keep him going, and for sure the the last door is the good one. He wakes up every single day just just um, happy to be alive, and to have someone like that in your room, <laughs> if you're rooming with them for three weeks and they're just telling you every day what, what a great day it is. Um, that's pretty nice, it's pretty humbling. At any age, you can learn something new from anybody that's within your life. And for Matt Heyman, seeing the way Esteban coped with that pressure in Spain probably inspired him to put his hand up again and accept the pressure one more time, perhaps another time again at Paris-Roubaix, the race that meant the most to him. Yam Cycling having presence. They came here with Oliver, Oliver Nas and part of me is local rider, Dries Stevenines as well, going great guns, but some saying perhaps he's lost a bit too much weight. Oh, we've had a mass crash behind. A mass crash behind, several riders from BMC down, and a couple of them not looking too good, I'm afraid. One rider from Orica Green Edge, with the size of the frame, you'd have to guess that it's Matt Heyman, but we'll wait to have a look. And as a rider, you know, and when I hit the ground, I knew I wasn't getting up. He didn't look like he was in pain or yelling or screaming or anything like that. It was just like this classic season over. I just wanted to get in the team car. I, wanted to, I just didn't want to be there anymore. Um, I knew something was wrong and, you know, the doctors come in, you know, six to eight weeks and I look at my phone, six weeks, that's the Saturday before Roubaix. So we should be right, shouldn't we? And uh, the doctor just says, no, you've got no chance, you know. Just take it easy, you know. That's it, life. You've, I've had 100 injuries before. I've broken, broken bones before. Just, you know, why push it? Oh, I couldn't believe it, yeah. I knew that he was in really good shape. He'd had a really good pre-season. He's leading into the classics. Um, maybe it was his last year, we didn't know. I tried to say, to spoke to him sometimes, and I say, okay, boss. It's all right, maybe you lose the classics, but you can't recover for the year or so. Always I try to take to my group again. I guess I, I got the cast on and went back to the hotel, you try and show a brave face and 
the highlight was I was going to be at home for a little while. Um, I had a five-year-old boy who was, came in a chicken suit to the hotel and thought it was pretty great that Dad was going to be home for a little while. Uh, I remember giving him a call and just trying to keep in touch with him through that period because I'd had so many setbacks in 2015, I knew exactly what he was going through. I knew how quickly he could be on a, on a trainer and, and a few other things that you can do to get back on your bike as quick as possible. Let's get on the home trainer and see what we can do. And um, about 15 minutes into that, I thought, what am I even doing here? Because I was actually embarrassed with that I couldn't even stay away from the bike for two days uh, with a broken arm that I had to get back on the trainer. And I texted the mechanic, I said, you know, where's my bike? Um, they said, oh, it's in Italy. I said, but what if I want to come and do a race next week? No, but you've got a broken arm. I said, but so you've written me off, you guys. It was only a couple of weeks before um, we were talking about who was going to be the last spot for Roubaix, and it was Chris Jewell Jensen or, or Matt Heyman. And I, I couldn't believe they were even floating his name, to be honest. He hadn't done any racing. He'd just been on the, on the ergo. And I thought, well, it's probably not a good idea for, the, for his just his, the help of his arm. We knew that he was training. We didn't probably realise how hard he was putting in to, to, make, to make the start line and how much it meant to him to even take the start line at Paris Bay. We didn't, I, didn't, I personally didn't realise that. He was sure that he wanted to do it. So we thought, oh, well, Chris Jewell Jensen will probably go further, but Heyman could probably con contribute quite well for Jens in that early period, given his experience. So we put him in just purely for that. I know Esteban had spoken to Matty leading up to Roubaix and I think it was drilled home. You know, the fact that he's starting Roubaix is, is a huge effort, huge result, and be happy with that. Enjoy it. Hey guys, welcome to Backstage Pass. Uh, this is a big one for us, uh, Paris-Roubaix um, 2016. It'll be my 15th attempt at winning and this guy's first. I don't know what he's trying to do here, but I don't think that's going to help. <laughs> They said it helped, so <laughs> I don't know. I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> so what's some uh, advice you can give, uh, Luca? Um, don't tape your wrists up. Um, <laughs> it's not that bad. So, uh, Matty, what's the uh, plan of attack? We don't have a, a super favourite here, but we do have uh, a solid group of guys who are actually getting quite experienced at this race. And with Jens Kukler running six last year, I think uh, I think he can go even better this year. So. We're hoping for a good day. Um, it's certainly one of my favourite days of the year and, and it's the one day of the year that I, I really wish I was still a rider. The, re the rest of the year, not so much, but you really miss it today. That's it, the flag is underway, the Depart Real, uh, as we start the 115th edition of uh, Paris-Roubaix, the queen of the classics. Matty comes back to me and he's like, oh, can you take these arm warmers to the car when you go back? I'm going to go on the brake. And I was like, oh, the brake's already gone. So I know I'm going to go on the brake. So, OK, no worries. And then uh, next moment, I uh, see Maddie step out of the side of the bunch, just bang, with like a group of five and went across to the brake. Now we're hearing that the 16 riders trying to force the lead here. Matty Heyman seems to have uh, made it into the group. Contact, is that contact Heyman? Matt Heyman's in the brake. I've come on the radio. I was like, whoa, he wasn't joking, was he? Eating, drinking, eating, drinking. We're looking now at the leaders of Paris-Roubaix. Two minutes and 37 seconds is the gap. We are seeing now Peter Sagan and Fabian Cancellara some 40, 50 seconds behind a group containing the big favourite, Tom Bonin. And now the chase is on, and this is going to be an intriguing entry now, Paul, into the forest. Fuck. 
There's, yeah. there's a doctor with him? It, is the ambulance there? Doctor there? Yeah. All the blood. It was hard to tell what was going on in the race. You know, the radios don't always work well, and the car, and it's chaos. So I'm getting some, some stuff on the radio, but, you know, they're three, four, five minutes behind with the car. But I knew that the, the bunch was split up and something was going down, and I could hear them coming, and it was under a minute now. And I thought, I don't want to get caught. Um, on a section of cobbles with crosswind. Look at this, Matty Haven here is just keeping up the tempo and riding away from the rest of the breakaway just now. Sure he's not okay. He's just riding. Yeah. He's a fucking idiot if he is. If he is attacking that, he's idiot, yeah. They've caught them. Heyman looks around, he's assessing. He knows that Luke Durbridge is in this group. I sort of got to Matty and I was like, Matty, this is a great situation. Matty's like, yeah, yeah, cool. I'm going to attack. And here comes an attack up the middle from Matthew Heyman. Brilliant ride, Matt Heyman. Heyman again. The big camp there, and the reaction is coming from Ian Stannard. So, Matthew, uh, the group behind, Cancellara group is at 25 seconds. 25 seconds. 62 kilometres still to race, and it is full throttle. Oh, and I hear someone punch her. I realise that it was that it was Luke. So I'm on my own again. But the man who now has taken responsibility of the pressure on the front of this group is Tom Boonen in person. Boonen's on the front. We've still got 50k to go, and he's ripping this group. He wants to notch up win number five at Paris-Roubaix. He's loved this race over the years. Oh, come on, Matthew, come on, come on. So as soon as he ends up the inside, I, I panic and I hit the brakes. And that could be the end for Heyman. He's lost the wheel, Matthew Heyman, and he's lost his momentum. Ah, he's dropped the sack. That's it. That's my Roubaix. It all came down to that. That's going to be the film that plays that's going to haunt me. I think Matty channeled 14 years of anger in that moment. Everyone wrote him off. It's life, man. You need to keep him fight, keep him going. The last door is the good one. Set Van Mark. As a kid, he would have had posters of Tom Bonin on his wheel. He's tearing the posters down, and he's tearing the heart out of Tom Bonin as he's tearing the legs off the rest of them. This section, there's a lot of gravel sections. Heyman is back! What a return of Matthew Heyman. He gets onto the wheel of Bosenhagen. The courage of Matthew Heyman. Great job, great job. One guy in the front, Van Marken. Great job, Matthew. Big Tomica. Looking for number five. Ed Valbosen Hagen has clipped the elbow. He's looked across the shoulder. Now Heyman responds. Matt Heyman chasing Tom Bonin, and Heyman gets there. Come on, Matthew. Here is a golden opportunity. If you're Matthew Heyman now, you've got to stay in the wheel. Matthew Heyman has won two professional races. Tom Bonin, 109. The odds are stacked against the Australian. Heyman aiming to become the second Australian to win the race. And Van Mark, Van Mark is back. Five up for the sprints. Tom Bonham up the top of the track. So too Matthew Heyman. He's getting the run up. He's taking advantage of the potential dive. Oh, come on, come on. Come on, Matty. Come on, Matty. Lead him out. Go, Matty. Yeah. Heyman is leading out. It's Stenard around the outside. Heyman with his nose in front. Bonin is trying to challenge, but it's Matthew Heyman. It's an early birthday present. Heyman holding on. Heyman wins. Yes! Fuck 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 yes
Thanks very much for everything. It's a special team, and special things happen on a special team. Yeah! I had my little girl beside me uh, asleep, and I, and I actually woke her up in the final kilometres because I had to share it with somebody. And uh, and I, uh, I, I I was emotional. I was holding it together until the Shane Banner rang me a few minutes later, and then I had to hang up on him. I couldn't uh, couldn't hold it together. I came out of surgery at about two in the morning and I was under anaesthetic but I was awake and the lady was wheeling me down the, the hall back to my room. She's like, Heyman, he wins the race. I'm like, yeah, Matt Heyman, he was in the race, that's right, you know. No, 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 Matt Heyman, he wins the race, Roubaix, you know. And I was like, Matt Heyman, he, he won Roubaix, you know, like it was still just so unbelievable. He gave me the hope and maybe a lot of others to hope that it can be done. I think determination and grit at the end of the day are gonna get you a hell of a lot further than talent. The greatest story our team has to share is, is the evolution of, of where we started and, and what we're now becoming. We've had fantastic successes. We've had some really disappointing and, and devastating moments as well. If you've got a vision and uh, you surround yourself with people that believe in that vision and have the same passion, you'll be successful. Performance will always come when the rest of your life is in line. And I think that's uh, something we miss in professional sports. I suppose what's funny when you look back at it is it started out as this Aussie DNA team, but really it took people from different countries, different cultures, and learning from those cultures. Really, that's what enabled them to grow, and that's what enabled them to be successful. What I find great about the association with Green Edge is that the whole team pulsates good fun, but it's not at the expense of good manners and good friendship and it runs right the way down to the mechanics, the soigneurs. Everybody in the team has got that same spirit and they all treat one another with great respect. So I think as a lesson in life is be respectful for your fellow human being and actually enjoy life. You know, enjoy it to the full because you only get one crack at it. Before we are riders, we are humans and this team is really human. Try a little love 
Yeah. 